Well, if you could please open your Bible or your phone to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Pastor Joe and I talked before church, and he agreed that for every one of these names I miss, for every one of these names I miss, the 42 names, he's going to give you a $100 bill. So, Pastor, if I just miss one, you're down like eight grand. So, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brethren. And Judah begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar. Perez begot Esron. Esron begot Aram. Aram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nasun. Nasun begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab. But Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. How are we doing? And David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. Ammon begot Josiah. And Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brethren about the time they were carried away into Babylon. Okay. And after they were carried away into Babylon, Jacob and I begot Salatil, Salatil begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Sadok, Sadok begot Achim, Achim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Matan, Matan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When is his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. For she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall bear a child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. We did good. Yes. Happy wife, happy life. Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, the New Testament kind of starts out similarly as the New Test or the Old Testament. Just like Genesis chapter one is this kind of long, dry, line by line genealogy, and it ends with the creation of, of man. And then in chapter 2, you have a story, a narrative, an unpacking of the creation of the man. Same thing here at the beginning of the New Testament. You have this long, dry genealogy. And then in the second part of it, you have a narrative, a story, a creation, this time of the, of the second Adam. And as you can see right there in verse 1, it starts out with the book. And we should think of a scroll. Most scrolls were about 27 foot long, so about as long as this room right here. And for example, the great Isaiah scroll that was found, one of the first seven scrolls that were found of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that is 27 foot long and it has 17 different pieces of leather or parchment sewn together to make it. So this originally, his original draft of the book would have been one of those gigantic scrolls. And it's the book of who, or the genealogy who, the Toledo of who, of, of Jesus. The, and he calls him there in verse number one, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And those, of course, are the two essential ancestors that the Messiah had to have. David, who in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is promised the, the, the 
the blessing of the, what's called the Davidic covenant. And then Abraham, who's given the Abrahamic covenant. So Abrahamic covenant essentially revolves around land and family, land and family, and the Davidic covenant revolves around ruling. So if you're going to rule as a king, you have to have a land to rule over, and you have to have a family and people to govern. So as you see there in verse number two, it begins with Father Abraham. So verses two to six, guys, and just those <laughs> those short verses right there, two through six, that covered a, covers a period of about 1,200 years in those four verses right there, 1,200 years. And uh, some of you might know, Mary also has a genealogy, doesn't she? In Luke chapter three. But Mary's genealogy, that one starts with Adam. And I don't know, I can't read Luke's mind, but Remember, Luke is writing to a different audience than Matthew is. Luke's crafting or tailoring his book for a cosmopolitan, Greco-Roman kind of audience, not Jews. But Matthew is crafting or tailoring his book for a specific people group, a specific audience, and that's Jews. So he's going to start with Abraham, unlike Luke, who started with Adam. So Abraham, right off the bat, we're dealing with someone here through whose loins the Messiah is going to come, who is what the Bible calls as good as dead. <laughs> He's a hundred years old. His wife's nine. Is there anyone in here who's 90? Not even a 90 year old person in here. A 90 year old wife, right? And then what happens to God's blessings, right? They give birth, as you can see right there, to Isaac. And as you know, names in the world of the Bible mean something. And Isaac means like to laugh, like with joy and glee. And what happened? Well, when you do the math, Isaac was 37 years old. When in Genesis chapter 22, God said, take now thy son, thy only son, not Ishmael, right? He was born out of in sin, as it were, out of wedlock, right? Take now thy son, thy only son, <laughs> Isaac, whom thou lovest, and do what? Offer him for a burnt offering at the place which I have told you. And Isaac was 37 years old, guys. I know I don't look 44, maybe 37, you know, but I mean, I could easily overpower a hundred year old man, you know, but Isaac didn't do that, did he? He, he submitted and like a sheep led to the slaughter, right? He let his father do whatever God told his father to do. But as you know, at the last second, God supernaturally intervened and he said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. So the promise was in jeopardy, guys. It was that close, as it were, on one level, to not happening. This whole thing, that close. And then as you can see in verse number two, we have some familiar names there with Jacob. And Jacob then begets Judah and his brethren. So that phrase in verse number two, and his brethren, this is the pool through which the Messiah is going to come. So there's 12 boys, as you know, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and Joseph. So the 12 boys, each of them had a give or take 8.5% chance to be the progenitor through whose loins the Messiah would come. And out of those 12 boys, Reuben, the firstborn, is disqualified from the birthright as being the heir because he slept with his father's concubine. Simeon and Levi, the next in line to receive the birthright, they're also disqualified because of their behavior at Shechem when they slaughtered every man, woman, and child. Remember how they made a pact? They made a covenant with the men of Shechem. You know, wink, wink, we'll be with you and you'll be with us. All you have to do is get the token, the sign of the covenant, get circumcised. And when all the men were sore, these two sons of Jacob went in and slaughtered every man, woman, and child. So you're disqualified too from the birthright. And then next in line is Judah. And Judah wasn't perfect, as we'll see in a second, but he, was, he wasn't bad, right? At least he wanted to not slay Joseph, but sell him, right, to the Ishmaelites to keep him alive. So the line goes here through Judah. But Judah, as you can see right there in verse number three, Judah, you know, he, uh, how can I put this? Uh, he, uh, let's keep it G-rated here. He went in onto a Canaanite cultic prostitute. This grandson or great-grandson of Abraham. And uh, in, as you know, her name is Tamar right there in verse number, number four there. And she begets twins. Uh, Pharaoh's and Esran. 
And what's interesting here is that God's pattern throughout history has at times been to go against the, the conventional wisdom by choosing the younger instead of the older as the heir. So right off the bat, right, he chooses Abel and not Cain, but Cain was born first. He chooses Isaac, not Ishmael, even though Ishmael was born first. Right? He chooses Jacob, not Esau, even though Esau, because all of these guys were deplorable and they self-inflicted right, their loss of the, of the birthright. So he goes through the line right here, as you can see in verse number three there, of Ferez. And then we get these names here in verses four and beginning of verse five that we really don't know a lot about. But what we do know is that this is the time when the Israelites would have been in bondage in Egypt for those 430 years, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse number 40. For example, this person named Nasun for, in verse 4. We don't even know who he is, but we do know that a couple things. Uh, that his sister was married to Aaron, the high priest. And when the Israelites would have marched through the wilderness, he would have been the, the prince of the tribe of Judah at this time. So if there were this throne in Jerusalem, that these people right here in verses 3, 4, 5, these would have been the kings if there was a throne in Jerusalem at that time. But the, he was the prince of Judah, and kind of like a chain of command, the 12 princes from the 12 tribes would have met with Moses and then delegated the instructions in the Torah down throughout the rest of the families and the clans within their tribes. Then we get down to verse the end of verse number five there, and we are entering into the period of the time of judges. So just like I said, from verses two to six, you're talking about 1,200 years of history. And Matthew, as we'll see at the end here, he's going to deliberately leave out or omit names from these three different blocks of 14 names. And he wants to do that because he's tailoring or crafting this in kind of like a, like a secret kind of cryptic message that's packed into it, which we'll get to see at the end here. But we have some familiar names, don't we, in verse number five. We got Boaz. Remember him from the book of Ruth? Most of us don't put two and two together. And when we read the book of Ruth, we don't remember that Boaz was, he was the son, the firstborn son of Rahab the harlot. And uh, once again, it's a reminder that God isn't so concerned so much about your pedigree on the one hand, but uh, he'll take anybody. Outsiders are welcome to come into the people of God as long as they, they convert and obey the law. You got Ruth, right? You got Uriah the Hittite, you got lots of different people there. And then this first section ends in verses two through six, this period of 1200 years of genealogy, kind of ends with this, with this idea that Israel is born for greatness. They're born for greatness. It starts with Abraham and it ends right there with David the king. And, and the sec that's the first block, but the second block of 14 names, even though these are all the kings, of Judah, none of them have the title, the king attached to them. Only David does, because Matthew's really concerned in this book about framing Jesus as the descendant, the son of David, and therefore the rightful heir of all the blessings that come along with the Davidic covenant. And then in verses 6 through 11 right there, in that second block of 14 names, this one kind of ends with a, the taste in your mouth that Israel has lost their greatness, that it couldn't get any worse than this. Well, let's survey that real quick. In uh, verse number 7, uh, David, he begets Solomon, of her that had been the wife of Uriah. We'll pause real quick. So Matthew, because he is portraying King David in a special way, he doesn't want to even mention the name Bathsheba. Uh, the Chronicler does something similar. When he, uh, when he writes his book, he paints King David as almost like Michelangelo's statue. There's no flaws, there's no chips, there's no Uriah, there's no Bathsheba. He doesn't even, Chronicler doesn't even mention it because that doesn't fit his framing of David. Oh, the only sin he does mention is when David does the census or counts the people, but that's it. Whereas Samuel, as you know, is more kind of like when, when they painted Winston Churchill's portrait, he sent it back because he said, where are all my warts? I, this isn't very real. It's not very authentic, as it were. But uh, Matthew is kind of along those lines because he needs to frame David in, in a pristine kind of way. So he kind of blushes and kind of leaves out the name Bathsheba there. But we get down to verses, like I said, seven and eight and following. 
and we're around 800 BC, give or take at this time, 1400 years after the promise was first given to Abraham. And you have one good administration and a bad administration. And a good, sound familiar? A good administration and then a bad administration. And it's just up and down, topsy turvy. But things are really, really getting dark and wicked here. I mean, so much so that, that the kings of Jerusalem, the sons of David, the literal physical descendants of Abraham himself are slaughtering innocent children and worshiping the God of Moab, Molech. I mean, things are just, if you lived at this time, you'd be like, oh my goodness, how can things get any worse? But right at the end, right at almost when it hits midnight in verse number 11 there, the people got a little revival. They got uh, in the midst of all this darkness. They had a short period of time where they had a godly ruler who was on their side, who maybe wasn't perfect, but who uh, believed that the Bible was the Bible and all those kind of good things. And his name was Josiah. Right, that right before everything fell apart, God gave a little extra grace to the people and gave them that respite of four years. Or oh, I didn't mean that, but uh, that little <laughs> that little respite of a period of time, right, where there can be some light before what happens next and what happens next. His the next in line to rule and reign, Jake Oniah. And uh, Jake Oniah was so wicked and so evil, so corrupt that Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 22, verse 30, walked into the, to the throne room and put a curse in 2230, put a curse on the throne that no descendant of King David will ever rule and reign from the throne in Jerusalem again. Thus saith the Lord. And that's what happened. If you look at when the Israelites came back under Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, you know those accounts, right? They don't, they're, 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 they're up. Persian satrap. They're not even rulers. They're governors. And then after that, with the Hasmoneans and the Maccabees, you know, they're not in an independent state. And when Herod the Great is king, Herod the Great wasn't a Jew. His father is a force converted to Judaism. His mother was a Nabataean from Petra. You ever see Indiana Jones, part three in the Last Crusade? Remember at the end of the movie? Right? How they, that's where she's from. So that's maybe why the wise men say, where is he that was born king of the Jews? You weren't born king of the Jews. You don't have the correct paperwork or credentials. We all know that. Well, the second section of 14 names, and it ends in total disarray. Israel that was once born for this nation, that was once born for greatness, and a light on a shining hill has been smashed to smithereens. And the people deserved every single bit of it because they turned from God. And then you got that third and final section here, guys, in verses 12 all the way down to verse number 16. Of all the 14 names here, there's only two of them that we really know who they were. You know, we all know Zerubbabel, right? But the rest of these names, even though we don't know who they were, and you're talking about like 600 BC down to, you know, we'll say zero. AD, that time period right there, even though we don't know who they are. These guys, if there was a throne in Jerusalem, these would have been the rightful kings. These would have been the heirs to the throne. And it's kind of interesting that this, this promise is kept alive, that even though it doesn't look like it could possibly happen, how in the world does this promise that God gave, what, 2,200 years ago, first to Abraham, how in the world can this even come true? It seems impossible that God's word can come true. But they keep the faith, they, and their names indicate that. Like so one of these guys is called Abiud. And Ab, as you might hear, is a clip form of Abba, or father. And Iud is a clip form of Yehudim, or Judah. So that's what his name is. I'm the father of the tribe of Judah. And then another man named Eliud. Eliud, El, is a clip form of Elohim, or God. Same thing, Iud, of Judah. My God's the God of Judah. So even in the midst of darkness and blackness, when it seems that nothing can happen, God's still at work. Even though he's behind the scenes, maybe a little. Even there, there's no revelation during the 600 or 400 year period, however long it was. You know, this is between Matthew and Malachi, that last book of the Old Testament. There's nothing. It's so quiet. But God's still at work. So much so that finally then, in verse number 16, we have Jacob. Jacob begot Joseph, of whom was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. 
And what's interesting here is that all throughout that list, you may have heard so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. But it doesn't say in verse number 16 that, does it? It doesn't say that Joseph begat Jesus. And the reason it doesn't say that, as you can probably guess, is because it, well, it does a couple things. Number one, it it gives Jesus the opportunity to be adopted by Joseph and then therefore avert or go around the curse that was put on the throne by Jeremiah in chapter 22, verse number 30, some 600 years ago. And of course, as you can tell, it also rules him out from being the father. And that last section then, like the first section, end, it ends with this promise, with this hope that God's still at work and Israel really was born for greatness. Then you have verse number 17 to kind of finish it off right there. What's going on here? These three blocks of 14 and 14 and 14. Well, when Matthew is writing this book, guys, under the inspiration of the Spirit, his primary source is kind of Ancestry.com is Chronicles. And he's going back to Chronicles, and he's using that to construct his... By the way, can anyone go back... Uh, can anyone go back five descendants in their family tree? Can you go five deep? Anybody? Just a couple of you? How about seven deep? Can anyone go back seven? Ten? Wow, you're doing good, honey. My wife is getting me this for Christmas. She's working on Ancestry.com. And it's pretty amazing, you know, who you're related to, right? Like there's horse thieves back there, right? And there's some like pretty despicable people and some, you know, and you know, on the one hand, Jesus, who's 100% man and 100% God, he kind of feels your pain. <laughs> Look at some of his relatives, these wicked kings of Jerusalem, these Canaanite prostitutes, right? Just crazy people, right? Who God works through this, right? To bring about glory to himself. But in these three blocks, you have the 14, the 14, the 14. Why did, why did Matthew do that? Well, to make a long story short, as some of you might know, in the worlds of the Bible, uh, there weren't letters like we think of letters. The numbers also functioned as letters. So if you wanted to say, you're number one, you'd say, you're Aleph, or you're A. Or I'll see you at three o'clock. We'd say, I'll see you at three, or I'll see you at Gimel. And, and so, so the letter equals a number. It's kind of like in Revelation 13. Remember when he says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is? Six, six, six. So in other words, John's saying, look, you people in the pew, you need to figure out how to do gematria or numerology, right? And you need to be able to calculate the, the weight of these world leaders' names. And if any of their names equal 666, six, six, you better watch that guy. Okay, that's the sense of it, right? But the cool thing is, is that David's name, David's name equals 14. Because you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, and a Dalet. So four plus six plus four equals 14. So when you add up history, the bottom line is that Jesus really is. He really is the son of David and the rightful heir to the throne. Then in verses 18 through 25, in that second section here, in 18 through 25, verse number 18, just like I said uh, back in Genesis, where after that long, dry genealogy in chapter 1, you have the narrative, the story, the unpacking of the creation of the first man, same thing here, but this time with the second Adam. Verses 18 through 25, guys, this event takes place. The whole block of this takes place in one night. It all takes place in one night in Nazareth. Verse number 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Or in other words, uh, the events we're going to read are going to precede the nativity. Okay, well, go on then. How, was, how did the birth of Jesus Christ come about? What were the events surrounding it? Well... When is his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together? Let's pause real quick. Uh, the Jewish wedding, the Jewish wedding motif or theme had two parts to it, has two parts to it. The first part is the espousal or the betrothal period. And uh, this could last for up to a year or more or less. But during this period of time, during this period of time, uh, this is when negotiations would be made with the father of the bride and these kind of things. And, but also, it was really a time of, of testing, of testing each other. And, but you're still considered married. It's not like you can really like back out of it, you know, because you see right there in verse number 18, uh, in 19, Joseph's called her husband even before right, the second part of the Jewish wedding ended. So that's the first stage of the Jewish wedding. 
So that's where we're at right here. So during this period of time, um, as you can see in verse 18, before they came together, uh, that not only has the idea, idea of knowing her as a man would know a woman, but it also has the idea of starting their lives uh, together as a couple in the father's house. Let's pause real quick. Uh, if you go to Israel today and you rent a car and go out in the West Bank, drive through the neighborhoods, you'll see, especially the Arab houses, you'll see a lot of them have just this concrete rebar sticking up on the roof. And to us, it looks like hideous. Like, why would you not just finish the job, you know? But uh, in their world, that's a sign of better things to come, of hope and of prosperity, because you want to marry off the girls, right, Bob? You want to marry off the girls <laughs> right, as soon as you can. <laughs> and, uh, and the boys, though, on the other hand, especially in their world, the boys functioned as their social security and their defense and their safety net and their protectors. So you want to keep the boys at home and not move to Monticello, Cole, right? You need to stay home with mom and dad. No, get me out of here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we don't live that, right? We live in 2020. But, uh, but uh, so the boy during that first stage of the Jewish wedding would be building a room addition onto the father's house. And then when he was done with that, he would, in the first part of the wedding was over, the spousal period, he would go get the girl and then bring her back to the father's house. And then that would be stage two of the Jewish wedding, the chuppah. And by the by, that's the exact theme or pattern or motif that we're in now is the bride of Christ. Where Christ, as you know in John 14, is in heaven. And in my Father's house are many rooms or mansions. And I'm going to prepare that place for you. And when he's done preparing that place, just like they would do here on earth, right? He'll come to the clouds, he'll get the girl, and bring the girl back to the Father's house in heaven. So this is kind of where Joseph and Mary are at right now. They're, they're happy, they're excited, like wow, we're going to get married anytime soon. Life couldn't get any better. And then what happens next? Oh, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Pause real quick. Now, we don't know how Joseph was told that Mary was pregnant before they got married. Uh, did he hear it through the grapevine? Did she send him a message? It doesn't really matter. All that does matter is that's what happened. And in their world, remember, you think your neighbors are nosy, okay? Here in like Sock Center, okay? And people are into your business. Imagine living in a slow paced tight knit, conservative world where you can't get in the car and go to Maple Grove or something, right? You have to stay here. Everybody thinks they know everybody's business. And if you live in that kind of slow paced tight knit, conservative world, I mean, according to the letter of the law, According to the letter of the law in Deuteronomy 22, 21, Mary was supposed to be executed because she played the harlot. Now, it goes to show you that in the world of the Bible, just like today, people always don't follow the word of God. <laughs> exactly. And maybe, you know, that's, I don't know, in this part, at least they didn't keep the letter. Maybe they kept the spirit. So um, it's kind of interesting to see how throughout Jewish history, right, how they their hermeneutics on how they interpret things can change. Sometimes it's very black and white and cut and dry, like at the time of Moses, right? But later on in history, things are a little, little more loosey-goosey. But he finds out here in verse number 18, right? Wow, now what do I do? She's pregnant? I'm not the father? Can you imagine the tremendous stigma that's going to be attached to this family? as we spend the rest of our life in this community of X amount of hundreds of people, everyone's going to be talking about us. Everyone's going to be pointing the finger. What do I do? Verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, now let's pause real quick. So after he got the word that Mary was pregnant and he wasn't the father, okay, after he got the word, we find out here that he's a just man. Now that word for just, it's also used of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the parents of, is it something I said? No. <laughs> okay. It's also used of them. And it basically, it means that they're law keepers, that they're Torah observant. It means that they fear God. It means that they keep his commandments. So, so this is who Joseph really was. He was a just man. And because he was a just man, it says that he wasn't make her, willing to make her a public example, but he was minded to put her away privately. What does that mean? Well, it means something like this. Look, I wasn't cut out for this. I didn't sign up for this, okay? I'm not the man for the job. 
I'm going to wake up in the morning, verse 19. I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to divorce her because I'm not the father and I can't do this. I, I didn't sign up for this. I don't have the backbone for this. I don't have the spine, the thick skin that's needed. I can't do this. I'm out. I'm out. That's where he's at. But he wants to do it discreetly because he, he loves Mary. He didn't want to shame her any more than she was in some people's eyes already shamed. So he wants to do it secretly, just in the presence of two or three witnesses, and I'm out. I'm out. Verse 20, but while he thought on these things, that is to say he had turned over in his mind what he was going to do, and he's reached the decision. I'm going to divorce her when I wake up in the morning. Okay. While he thought on these things, then what happens? Boom! The same angel, probably the same angel, who appeared to Abraham and stopped Abraham. Remember, Abraham also was obeying his conscience. Abraham was obeying what God revealed to him, even though it was extreme to the nines. Okay? Joseph was doing the same thing. Joseph was committed to the law, to what God had revealed. And just like God supernaturally intervened and stopped Abraham at the last second from harming that child through whom every nation of the earth would be blessed, he does the same thing here in his mercy and in his kindness. He intervenes at the last second, stops Joseph from only doing what he knows is the right thing to do. And he stops him from hurting the promised child. While I thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, he's going to assure him now, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So he didn't even know that it was from the Holy Spirit the baby was until at this moment. In this verse, guys, among other things, it shows us, it shows us how Jesus had the legal right, how he had the legal status to be a son of David, even though Joseph wasn't his father. This ultimate testimony of the, the virgin birth, our cardinal doctrine, right? It continues right here in verse number 21. The angel is still speaking. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Like we just touched on earlier, guys, you know that names in the world of the Bible mean something. They're loaded and they're packed with meaning. And the name of Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua. When I was a missionary in Israel, when I went to school there for a thousand days, uh, I've, I worked all the time with Jews for Jesus. I did the, the first five of their 12 campaigns throughout all the Holy Land. And our main objective was to clear up his name. If you go to Israel today or you talk to a Jewish person on the street or you go to a museum or something and you say Yeshua, they're going to think you're talking about Joshua, Moses' servant, because it's the same name, just Hebrew and Greek, same name. They don't even know his real name, that it means salvation. They think it's not Yeshua, but Yeshu. What happened is the wicked rabbis many years ago erased the last letter in his name, the Ein, and made it into an acronym which means, may his name and memory be blotted out forever. So that's what they think of Jesus. But you, Joseph, because this is who he is, you're going to call his name Yeshua, the beautiful name, because he's going to save, it means salvation, he's going to save his people from their sins. So let's pause real quick and we get down to verse number 22. We're almost done, guys. Why did God have to do it this way? <laughs> it's so complicated and difficult. and Because and, it takes faith. It, it just goes against every conventional wisdom that you could possibly think through. How, why did all this happen? Well, all this was done. Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. That phrase, that it might be fulfilled, 
That's used multiple times, double digit times in the book of Matthew, because Matthew, remember, is writing to Jews, and a Jew would be concerned that this happened in order that this might be fulfilled. Whereas Luke or the other authors, right, they're dealing with a different group of people, so they really don't go there. So, in other words, Matthew explains that this was all predicted way, way back when in the pages of the Old Testament. We're all familiar with this famous verse in Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. But what's kind of neat here is when he says that um, uh, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. So, uh, names in the world of the Bible uh, meant something even to Jews who were in captivity. Remember, he's writing to not necessarily the Jews in Judea, but the Jews throughout the entire Roman Empire. And a lot of these guys in the diaspora, they don't read Hebrew, they can't understand Hebrew or Aramaic, they're just Greco-Roman people and they speak Latin and Greek and these kind of things. So, so he has to interpret to them that one of his other names, it means God with us, the divinity of the Son. And when he says that which was, he says, which was spoken of the Lord, he doesn't use the phrase of the prophet. And the reason he does that is he wants to replace the name of Isaiah with the name of God to kind of associate Jesus as being the son of God. It emphasizes Jesus' divine sonship if he's of the Lord. And then verse number 24, what happens next? Well, Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. So in other words, he, he keeps with his righteous character. He goes against all odds, as it were. He's got to have a truckload of faith to be able to get through this. Thick skin, steel to spine right here, because it's going to be really, really, really hard for a long time. But he's going to do it. He's going to trust in God to help him get through this. So he takes her to his wife. That is to say, they have the second part of the Jewish wedding. He brings Mary back to his father's house. They're there in Nazareth. And then verse number 24, then he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. That is to say, um, Joseph being a sinner, didn't want to go in onto his wife until the baby was born for obvious reasons. But he did go in onto her after that. We know from Matthew 13, 55, for example, that after Jesus, Mary and Joseph had four boys and then, and then multiple girls. It says his sisters. So there was at least seven kids right, in the house of, of Mary and Joseph. But it says here that Joseph names the child. And by Joseph naming Jesus, he publicly acknowledges Jesus as my son, my adopted son, he's a lawfully born member of this family, and we are going to love him and accept him with open arms, and this clinches, clinches Jesus' place in the Davidic line and in the family of God. And like Joshua the priest, same name, right? Like Joshua the priest, Jesus is the high priest is going to be able to intercede and mediate for his people. Like Joshua the ruler, he's going to be able to lead his people into the promised land. And this genealogy, guys, this genealogy, just like our genealogies, is filled with some crazy people, okay? <laughs> uh, it's true. And... But you know what, what this genealogy does, among other things, is it shows us, once again, that Jesus is the friend of sinners. He loves them, right? He didn't come to call the righteous, right, but sinners. And that's all about, it's all about Christmas. It's the reason for the season. It's why he came, right? His name is called Emmanuel because he's God with us. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you love us despite our flaws and despite our our. our or many sins, but you love us, and you died for us, and you came for us, and you love everyone, Lord God, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, and you'll forgive anybody if they want to be forgiven, and we appreciate that, God, that you're not some mean Lord ruling over us with a rod of iron, but that you love us, and that you work with us, and that you accept us, and that you're gracious, and that you're kind. Thank you so much, Lord for this time of year and help us just to really relish and love this upcoming week where we celebrate the birth of your son. We love you so much, Lord of hosts, God of Israel. We pray you continue to bless us and protect us and provide for us and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.